In previous lectures, we looked at several different notions of necessity, fate, karma, predestination. But in the scientific worldview, none of these views is all that prominent. There is, however, a notion of necessity that has captivated people in the scientific world, and that is the idea of causal determinism, that events are inevitable because of what happened before. The earliest known version of determinism was advocated by early Greek philosophers known as the atomists. Atomism is an extremely interesting philosophy, and many features of it were remarkably prescient, that they're similar to views that many scientists have held since the scientific revolution. So one of the key doctrines that the atomists promoted was that the only thing that exists are atoms and the void, that is, empty space. So atoms and empty space. And atoms, according to the atomists, are particles that are so small that they can't be divided. So in the nuclear age, what we call atoms, at least strictly speaking, wouldn't count as atoms in the Greek sense because they can be divided. In addition to the view that all that exists are atoms in the void, a natural corollary of this is that the gods don't exist, that there's nothing outside of the atoms in the void. And this is new. Given what we've seen before from the Greeks, this was a novel idea that there's no such thing as gods at all. It's just atoms and empty space. The earliest known atomists were the Greek philosophers Leucippus and Democritus, both of whom lived in the 5th century BCE. Democritus was known as the laughing philosopher. And one theory is that this is because he regarded life with humor since everything was meaningless. It was just these random, elect or these random atoms in the, in the void. Relatedly, though, some people thought that atomism was actually a positive and optimistic philosophy because we don't need to fear the gods or an afterlife full of pain. So we're relieved of all of those kinds of worries. In a fragment from the lost work on the mind, Leucippus claims Nothing happens at random, but everything for a reason and by necessity. I mentioned this passage in the, in the first lecture. This is the first statement we have of determinism, and it captures the core idea that everything that happens happens for some kind of reason, there's some kind of explanation. The atomists, though, rejected the, the view that was then familiar, that the outcomes are a product of divine fate. We saw these ideas reviewed in Lecture 2. Since they don't believe in the gods, they don't believe in that the gods are doing it, they don't believe fate is responsible at all. Instead, the atomists thought that actions, events, everything that happens has to have some kind of natural explanation. There has to be some kind of what we now think of as a scientific explanation for why things happen. And the presumption was that every event has a cause. And one of the statements that's associated with the view is nothing comes from nothing. That if you start out with nothing, then you won't get anything. That you have to ha something that happens has to come from something. It has to have some, some cause that's prior. And when you put it like that, it seems pretty reasonable that everything has to come from something else. Anything that happens has to have been caused by something else. But once you adopt that view, that every event has a cause, it seems like it's a short step to a global determinism. Because what happens now has a cause, and that had a cause, and that had a cause, and you can just keep going. And that's the idea that the atomists were promoting, that you could just tell a causal story all the way down. The atomists also wanted to give at least a little more detail about how this is supposed to work. And they offer a really simple account of the movements of the atoms. So what they thought was that the current movements of atoms, what's happening to atoms right now, are determined by what the atoms are like. And we'll use the term properties here um, for that, what the atoms are like. And so it's the properties of the atoms and the previous movements of the atoms. To take a rough analogy, consider a pool table. Whether the balls go in certain directions depends on the properties of the balls. That is, where they are, how heavy they are, those kinds of things. It depends on that, the properties of the balls, and the immediately prior movements of the balls. So if you want to know, say, why, why did the seven ball go in the side pocket, you presume that the answer will be given in terms of something like where the balls were, how fast they were going, what the spin was, what the angles were. Those are the kinds of things that you would appeal to to explain why the seven ball went in the pocket. And that's a rough analogy 
to the idea that the atoms movement is caused by the properties of the atoms and the atoms previous movements. So thinking about it in terms of a pool table is actually pretty reasonable. But there are a couple of ways in which it's disanalogous. One is that the atom has thought that the atoms only ever move in one direction, down. And pool wouldn't be a very interesting game if that were the case. But there's a second reason why the pool analogy is inadequate. With the pool table, there are lots of possibilities for outside interference. So earthquakes can affect the balls, floods, bad construction, and of course, people with pool cues. So what happens on a pool table is not a complete system. It's dependent on a lot of things in the outside world. But the atomists thought that the entire universe is captured by their theory. There is no other force outside of the atoms, their properties, and their motions that could interfere. The idea is that the system is complete. So there's nothing left out of the system. Everything is just the atoms in the void. And so the pool table, you can think of the pool table as an example in a kind of microcosm. If you just think about the pool table, then that's a decent analogy. But it has to be the pool table writ large across the entire universe. Now, their idea was that everything has a kind of cause, and that means everything has, in their view, a natural reason. Natural is a key component here of the, of the story, because there's another sense in which it's all random for the atomists. So every event has a cause, but the entire sequence is random. There, it's not like there's any providential reason for any of it. And this is in contrast to the fate of Homer, where we think that, yeah, what happens is a result of what the gods did. So here, it's random in the broad sense. For the atomists, there's no reason for any of it at all. It signifies nothing. Later Greek philosophers, the Stoics, offered a different kind of determinist account. Stoicism came to prominence in the 4th century BCE, and the founder of the school was Zeno of Sidium. The Stoics famously maintained that one should face life with equanimity, even when under distress. And they took this stoical view towards life itself. So they thought life was, everything was entirely determined. But this, they thought, was an important fact, and we should, we should tailor our lives in this stoical way and repress emotions when appropriate, which was you, most of the time, according to the, the Stoics. Like the atomists, the Stoics thought that every event has a cause, but unlike the atomists, the Stoics maintain that the cause has to be rational. It has to make sense in some deeper way. There has to be some reason why the event happened. So remember, for the atomists, the whole thing is just random in the sense that there's no rational justification. The atomists just give a naturalistic kind of scientific explanation. The Stoics want something that is much more ambitious, and this deeper kind of explanation, this deeper reason, is given by divine providence. So unlike the atomists, the Stoics did believe in the gods. So there's a sense in which the atomists and the Stoics agreed with the statement, everything happens for a reason. But it's only if we think of it in terms of causal reasons. So if we return to the pool table example, we can certainly say, the atomists can certainly say, that the reason the seven ball went into the corner pocket is because the cue ball hit the seven and banked it off the opposite rail or something like that. The atomists can say something analogous about the atoms, but none of it has any deeper meaning or rationale. And that's where the Stoics diverge. For them, it's not enough that every event has a cause. It has to have a reason in a more full-blooded, purposeful sense. In this respect, the Stoic view resembles older Greek notions of fate, for on those Greek notions of fate, the older notions, things that happen for a reason, they happen because the gods make it so. They intend that it come about. But as we saw with those older ideas of fate, the reason itself need not be a good reason. For the Stoics, that's required. It has to be a good reason. It isn't enough that every event is caused. So unlike the notion of fate, the Stoics maintain that the reason for an event has to be a good reason. In addition, and again, unlike Homeric fate, the kind of early fate in Greek uh, philosophy and religion. For the Stoics, it applies to every single thing, not just to some special subset of our outcomes. This kind of determinism, 
that everything is a product of providence, everything happens for a good reason, can justify the stoical attitude. It makes sense to accept what happens to you because it's all part of a cosmic order that's best for everyone, that's best for everything. And so the Stoic philosophy of life seems to fit pretty well with their philosophy of nature and their philosophy of the universe. But there's an important concern that emerges from the fact that Stoic determinism is a kind of global fate, that every event is fated. And this concern was developed into an, a, an influential argument in the period that was dubbed the lazy argument. And here's a way to put the argument. According to Stoic determinism, some people are fated to be poor and other people aren't. So me, I am either fated to be poor or I'm not. Since it's just fate whether I'll be poor or not, it doesn't matter what I do now because if I'm not fated to be poor, I won't be poor regardless of whether I work hard. And if I am fated to be poor, I'll be poor even if I do work hard. So I might as well just relax, kick back and see whether I'll get rich. So that's the idea of Stoic determinism. It seems like it says, whatever happens is going to happen. That's a worry because you might think, well, does the Stoic view really entail this? Because that seems like a bad consequence of it. The Stoic philosopher Chrysippus, who lived from about 280 to 206 BCE, had a response to this argument because he was concerned that this, this would have bad implications for Stoicism. And he said, well, some events are what he called co-fated, meaning you won't get a certain outcome without an earlier event. So we might say that food poisoning, getting food poisoning is co-fated with eating tainted food. Whether I'll get food poisoning is fated. That's, you know, that's set out from the beginning of time. But if it comes about, it will only be because I ate tainted food. There's no other way to get food poisoning. Similarly, Chrysippus would say, being poor might be co-fated with being lazy. So if you're lazy, then you may be more likely to be poor because those two things go together. So Chrysippus says, the lazy argument is a really bad argument for trying to give you a reason to be lazy. Because on the Stoics notion of fate, your fate is precisely a product of what happens before you meet your fate. As we'll see in the next lecture, some philosophers think that this response to the lazy argument doesn't really get to the heart of the matter. But it does, even as we've seen it so far, serve to highlight a point about determinism that continues to be really important. And that is, the Stoics use the term fate to describe their view, but their notion of fate is very different from the notion of fate that we encountered in Lecture 2. For on the earlier notion of fate, certain outcomes are fated regardless of what happens before the event. So it didn't matter what Oedipus did. He would still end up killing his father. The outcome was guaranteed regardless of the causes that led up to it. To our contemporary ears, this view sounds really implausible. Just to take a sort of uh, easy example, if I was fated to give this lecture at this time, then on that older notion, the, the notion that you see in the Greeks, early Greeks, I would be giving this lecture regardless of what happened before I gave it. So even if I'd been run over by a bus on my way to the studio, I'd still be giving this lecture because that was inevitable. It had to happen no matter what. Maybe the gods would just prop me back up to give the lecture. I don't know. But of course, to us, this all sounds like really unlikely. It runs counter to our everyday experience. Getting over, running over by a bus is exactly the sort of thing that prevents people from giving their lectures at their appointed times. Unlike this view of fate that you get in Homer and uh, the early Greeks, determinism, whether it's atomistic or stoic fate, maintains that what I'm doing right now is precisely a consequence of what happened before. So the Stoics maintained when an outcome is fated in their sense, it comes about precisely as a product of earlier fated events. To return to the example of me giving the lecture, if different things had happened before I came to give the lecture, then this might have meant that I wouldn't give the lecture. Determinism can allow all of that. It's distinguished from fatalism of this older sense because fatalism says certain outcomes are inevitable regardless of what precedes them. Determinism, atomistic determinism, stoic determinism, the next kind of determinism we'll see, it says that all actual outcomes are inevitable 
because of what precedes them. That's why they're inevitable, because of what happens before. You can't sort of take that out of the equation. That's critical. So far, we've just been looking at notions of determinism from the early ages of philosophy. But in today's world, we think about determinism in a more scientific way on the basis of views about the relationship of physical objects. And this kind of physical determinism became really prominent in the 18th century. So this is the prominent view of the physical world, that every physical event that happens is an inevitable consequence of the prior conditions, where the objects were, how they were moving, so the prior conditions and the physical laws, those two, those two things together were supposed to explain why things happen. So I'll tell a little bit more about this as we go on, but one, one foundational part of the view was the theory of physics that was proposed by Newton was so elegant and powerful. So you all remember probably Newton's laws of motion, that the law of inertia, that a body at rest will remain at rest, the second law that force equals mass times acceleration, and the third law that to every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. These and some other basic, these are the core, but the basic physical laws like these were supposed to be complete. So Newton's laws of motion are supposed to provide a story for which you don't need anything else. If you want to know why a physical object moved the way it did, you wouldn't need to ask a biologist or a chemist, much less a psychologist, that the whole story about how objects move would be given by the physics. So even for very little particles, the whole story would be given by the physical laws of motion. Nothing other than a physical event causes physical events, and physical events will always follow the law of physics, the laws of physics. So, it's important at this point to recognize that on the scientific view, everything is made up of physical particles. Rocks, trees, guppies, and of course, people. And so if we have a complete story about how particles move, given by the physics, we thereby have a complete story about rocks, trees, guppies, and people. And so that is the scope of determinism. It applies to everything. Because it applies to the basic physical constituents, and everything is made up of those physical constituents. This general account of physical determinism was prominently articulated by the French philosopher and mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace, who lived from 1749 to 1827. And it was presented in an introduction to a book he wrote on probability theory. Laplace begins his account by saying, we ought to regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its anterior state, that is, what was, came before, and as the cause of the one to follow. This is the familiar way, thinking of determinism as causal inevitability, that Laplace is saying that every event is caused by the event that happened before it, and it will always behave exactly as dictated by the forces of nature. Laplace then goes on to make a colorful suggestion about what this means. He says that this has implications for the predictability of events. And he proposed a demon that he said, let's imagine that there was a demon who knew where every particle was and he knew all the forces of nature. Then that demon could, in principle, predict where everything would be at a later time. And in a famous passage he writes, given for one instant an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated, and the respective situation of the beings who compose it. An intelligence sufficiently vast to submit these data to analysis. For it, nothing would be uncertain, and the future as the past would be present to its eyes. So here we get complete predictability, according to, Pla to Laplace, just like we did with divine foreknowledge. But now the explanation for why we're completely predictable is completely different. The reason our actions are predictable is because everything that happens is causally inevitable given what happened before it. That's Laplace's suggestion, that that is entailed by determinism. In this sense, modern determinists are much more like the atomists than like the Stoics, because unlike the Stoics, modern determinists don't appeal to God or providence as directing the deterministic system. God isn't part of the equation here. 
And this is reflected in a legendary paraphrase of an exchange between Laplace and Napoleon. Laplace gave Napoleon a copy of his book that described the system of the world, and Napoleon asked, how does God fit into your picture? And Laplace's understated response was, I have no need of that hypothesis. So Laplace thought, I don't need God to explain the universe. The entire explanation will be given in terms of the basic laws of physics. It'll be useful to have one last way of characterizing determinism, because philosophers have spent enormous effort trying to get the best characterization of determinism. So here's one further way. Imagine you have two completely independent and isolated word, worlds that are, at a given instant, in exactly the same state. That is, they have the same number of items arranged in exactly parallel ways with exactly the same properties. In that case, if determinism is true, those two worlds will be in exactly the same state at every instant in the future. The worlds will evolve or develop in exactly the same way because the deterministic laws will operate in exactly the same ways. So this is, as I say, a prominent view after the scientific revolution. It continues to be an influential view. Why should we believe determinism? Why should we believe this thesis that everything that happens is causally inevitable given what happened before? Determinism is should be stressed, it's a global thesis. It says that every single event is a product of prior events. As a result, it's unlikely that any of these thinkers had adequate evidence to support their views. To be sure, the atomists and the Stoics, and the Stoics had astonishingly little evidence. But this is also true for many current scientific endeavors. So if you think about the kinds of phenomena that are primarily at issue in the free will debate, we're interested in the decisions of extraordinarily complicated organisms, us. Or even consider the complicated biological processes of digestion or the circulation of the blood. In studying these complex processes, we see, as scientists, a great deal of variation between cases. So just to take another field, think about meteorology, our theories of meteorology. These theories give very good weather predictions. But they're far from perfect. There is a lot of variation. Now, the fact that there is variation doesn't prove that determinism is false. There are lots of other factors involved in what determines whether or not or what fixes whether or not we have a storm or whether we have a hurricane. And it's possible that we just haven't identified all of the causal factors or how their influence plays out. But it's important to note that the fact that we make such good predictions about the weather doesn't provide evidence that determinism is true regarding weather systems because some of the remaining unpredictability might be a product of fundamental randomness. Unless you had some antecedent reason, some prior reason for favoring determinism, you could not look at the evidence on weather data and say, oh, that shows determinism is true. The fact that our theories, like our theories about the weather, fail to deliver perfect predictions leaves us in a position that can be explained by both determinists and indeterminists. Determinists say we have missed out some of the relevant factors and that's why eventually we should be able to get the predictions. Indeterminists say the reason we're not getting perfect predictions is because there's a random element in here that we're never going to be able to explain. So when people do meteorology, when they want to understand weather systems, they typically reject the idea that the unpredictability results from randomness because we assume determinism about weather systems. But it's not because the evidence uniquely favors it. Rather, it's an assumption that we take when we go into the project trying to figure out what will happen in weather systems. So why believe determinism? I think that the real force of determinism for these philosophers and for scientists as well was not the evidence. It's not that they accumulated a lot of evidence and said, see, we've shown that every single event is an inevitable consequence of what happened before it. Rather, I think the conviction that the, it comes from the conviction that there has to be an explanation for anything that happens. The conviction that there has to be an explanation for anything has guided science for centuries and it's produced ample rewards. Scientific and medical breakthroughs have been guided by the view that what we know at any given point is inadequate and that there must be a better story, theory, or medicine to be found. 
when we have a partial, incomplete explanation for a phenomenon, we tend to think that there's still more to be, to be discovered. We don't think, well, that's probably it. Let's pack up our bags and go home when we end up with an incomplete explanation. And that's probably been an important factor in what's made us so successful in science, that we've had this presumption that, of course, there has to be an explanation. And that's driven us to look for explanations. And often those drives have, have bear, borne fruit, that they've been really successful. So I think it's a good thing that we have this natural inclination to expect that there's an explanation. And the idea that there has to be an explanation for everything is something that really resonates with us. It even resonates with very young children. Not only are children famously inquisitive, asking why all the time, but experimental work suggests that they naturally expect for there to be an explanation for any pattern that they see. So, for instance, in one recent experiment, children were asked questions like, why is this rock pointy? And they say things like, so that people won't sit on it. They, they won't say, well, for no reason. There's no reason why the rock is pointy, even though the explanation they give in that case is clearly wrong. Rocks aren't pointy. They, they don't emerge pointy so that people don't sit on them. More generally, I think, we can see the thirst for explanation in one perennial philosophical puzzle, and that is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why, why is there anything at all? This question has led some to think that there must be a God who created the universe. But, of course, if one was happy to accept things without any explanation, then there shouldn't be any pressure to explain why the universe exists at all. Nonetheless, there is considerable force to this question, why is there anything? It seems intuitively like there has to be some explanation for why the universe exists, whether or not that explanation is religious. That intuition that there has to be an explanation might be wrong. That's not our topic. But the fact that we have the intuition suggests that we're guided by a strong expectation that things, events, happenings should have some kind of explanation. And that, I think, is really at the core of why scientists and philosophers have found determinism to be such an attractive doctrine, because it flows from the idea that everything that happens has to have some kind of explanation. The doctrine of determinism continues to be quite a prominent view in the sciences. It's important to note that determinism is really a general view about systems. It's often framed in terms of physics, but one could locate determinism in more specific systems. For instance, if you think about psychology, you think about psychological processes, you could maintain that psychological processes are determined. You could, be, you could be agnostic about a lot of the rest of the world, but maintain that every single thing that happens in your psychology, every psychological event, can be explained by appeal to other psychological events that happened before it. So every decision is somehow a function of the psychological inputs to that, to that decision. Or you could be a determinist about biochemical processes and say that every particular biochemical event is caused by other biochemical events, that that system is deterministic. We will see in Lecture 12 that the thesis of physical determinism is under dispute in contemporary physics. The dominant physical theory of our time is no longer the Newtonian physics that inspired Laplace to be a determinist. Rather, the dominant physics of our times, as it relates to the motion of physical objects, is quantum mechanics. But theorists disagree about whether or not quantum mechanics requires that determinism is false, and we'll look at that to, to some extent in Lecture 12. This concludes the review of the various doctrines of necessity. So we've looked at a number of different doctrines as they've developed historically, fate, karma, predestination, and now causal determinism. For the rest of the course, we'll focus almost entirely on issues that are, when we think about determinism, almost entirely on issues related to causal determinism, because that is the idea that really captured scientific worldviews um, and has continued to exercise enormous influence in both science and philosophy. But in the next lecture, we'll start looking at how philosophers of free will
have responded to the threat of determinism, how they've tried to address the possibility that if determinism is true, what would that mean for free will? And do we have reason from thinking about free will to reject the determinist hypothesis that we've just reviewed?